in the uh, original series of Star Trek, the one with Kirk and Spock and McCoy and that kind of thing, where we were introduced to Klingons and that, um, there's an episode called Operation Annihilate, where the concept of physical pain, of mind-blowing proportions, is examined. Um, people become infected by these beings that wrap themselves around the inside of their nervous system and drive them completely mad with unbearable agony and control them that way. Um, it's an it's a infection um, by, I guess, a parasitical being that is actually quite intelligent. Um, but anyway, it's just the whole idea is that you you lose your autonomy when pain reaches a certain point, and that idea is examined there in that episode quite effectively, actually, in, in quite disturbingly, to be honest. Um, it uh, doesn't really pull any punches, especially for you know its age, 1968 or seven or something like this. It's uh, in many ways that series was decades ahead of its time, but that episode in particular, dealing with that kind of subject matter was uh, pretty revolutionary, if you ask me, but being science fiction, it went over most people's heads. <laughs> um, but an interesting quote from that, um, Spock, the Vulcan, um, you know, they're known as very cerebral and zen-like and into all these neat sort of self-control mechanisms and stuff like that, very stoic and totally in control of themselves. Um he uh, almost meets his match with the, the, the alien things, the parasites. They're called Denivans, I think, or whatever they are. Um, he gets infected, and he volunteers to go back down to the planet to get one of these things so they can study it and figure out how they can deal with it, one of the parasites. And uh, Kirk looks at him and says, Are you sure you're in any state to do this? You're... You know, you're you're going through what you're going through right now is the equivalent of most people say being I don't know, stabbed in the eye with a nail. <laughs> um, you, you, what you've got is unbearable, and we know it's unbearable, and we think that it's a bit crazy for you to try and do anything like this while you're in extremis. In as much as anything is ever in extremis, you are in extremis. Um, the pain of these beings is that bad. Spock said something, one of my favorite quotes from Star Trek ever, and I've got a lot of them. Star Trek is known for its good one-liners, especially the original series. Um, Spock retorts, Pain is a thing of the mind. The mind can be controlled. Now, um, first of all, is pain a thing of the mind? That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Um, where is pain experienced? Okay, I let's say I have something horrible happen, or I do something crazy. Let's say I just take my hand and I put it on a red-hot element of my stove for whatever reason. Or not even red-hot, just hot enough to be very painful. Um, okay, my hand gets damaged, my nervous system reacts and sends impulses to my brain. Where is that pain experienced? Not where is the damage taking place that causes the pain. Where is the pain actually experienced? Now you look at it this way. Um, another line little Mi from Little Big Man. A guy um, gets um, blinded. He's shot in the neck, but it severs one of his nerves, and he's blinded. But he's otherwise perfectly okay after the wound heals. And he says... You know, he's a native guy, and, you know, allegedly they speak in these interesting metaphors. And he says, um, oh, my eyes still see. It's just, it, it doesn't reach my heart. That's all. My eyes are fine. They still see everything. Interesting thought. And I would apply that, say, to pain. Um, if I put my hand on a red-hot stove, a red-hot element, or not even a red-hot one, just a hot one, um... Where is the pain experienced? Think about that. Um, think about it in terms of the nervous system. Um, I put my hand on, a, on, on, this, on the, the element and I feel excruciating pain. Let's say that the same thing happens to me as happened to the fellow in the movie Little Big Man. 
A nerve is severed. I put my hand on the stove. Exactly the same thing has happened as when my nerve was not severed. But there's a completely different reaction from my central nervous system. I might react with fear, with um, extreme agitation seeing this happening to my hand, but I, I might not actually experience any physical pain if all the nerves to my hand or my arm had been severed. I can't feel a thing. But the nerves are still getting damaged and they're still firing impulses off to various places. Um, but I, the brain isn't receiving any of them. So it looks to me as though <clears throat> pain is only at the experiential level, at least in terms of brute physical pain. So I tend to agree that pain is a thing of the mind. <clears throat> least physical pain. I'm not ultimately feeling the pain of a severely burnt hand in my hand. I'm feeling it in my mind. <clears throat> um, so yeah, okay. We can say that pain is a thing of the mind. Um, axiomatically, of course, provisionally. Um, because there's all kinds of other dimensions to it, but I'm talking about just the brute physical stuff. In the Star Trek episode, they make it very clear that Spock is, um, has said that the mind can be controlled, etc. That's an interesting concept as well, controlling your mind. What's controlling your mind if your mind is under control? Your mind is controlling itself. Okay, that implies that one part of your being is out of control or wants to be out of control, and the other, the other part wants to control it. Um, subject, object stuff, possibly a quirk of language, whatever. <clears throat> But they point out in Star Trek that it's not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, Vulcans are supposedly um, superhuman. You know, they're caricatured that way. But Spock, half-human, I guess, maybe that's the implication, is obviously struggling to control himself. But you see other cases where, um, where he is in complete control of himself, like in another episode where they're captured by cosmic Nazis. He's being flogged. He's just ignoring it. It just whatever flog me I'll just turn off that those nerves and that's the end of it <laughs> um, I'll deal with the damage to my skin but in this case he's struggling seriously and sometimes he's near prostrated by the agony that he's enduring even for a Vulcan even a half Vulcan he is being besieged by unspeakable agony but he carries on he manages to do it he manages to accomplish his task down on the planet even though he is racked by waves and waves and waves of near, I don't know, psychotic pain, physical pain. So, it, yes, okay, it's all very well to say that the mind can be controlled and pain is a thing of the mind. Um, but it's not bloody easy, is it? Um, okay, there's, the, there's another story which actually might be more close to reality, but it, but it surrounds a Hindu saint, so you really you never really know with these things. There's a lot of hagiography surrounding them, but I don't know. I can see this actually happening. Um, Ramakrishna apparently died of uh, either throat cancer or some kind of horrible, painful condition in his throat that caused his throat to swell up. Later in life, <clears throat> a doctor uh, who had come to visit him to check, he was they, everybody knew he was dying went to probe the tumor or whatever it was in his neck to have a look at it. Now, just touching one of these tumors is enough to usually knock somebody unconscious, the amount of pain you're going to feel. And so the doctor one day came in and he went to just sort of do his usual feel and probe and everything. And Ramakrishna went, wait, 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 hang on, hang on. Give me five minutes. And they sat down and engaged in, I don't know, whatever kind of meditation he did. He said, okay, go ahead now. And the doctor was able to probe and feel and sort of do his horribly painful stuff. And Ramakrishna allegedly acted as though he felt nothing. <clears throat> I'd say that that's at least in theory possible. Um, <clears throat> pain is an odd thing, and it does seem to be a thing of the mind. Um, 
the mind does seem to respond to attempts to control it. Um, there are all kinds of ways you can do it. You can simply do what the Spartans did and inflict so much physical pain on yourself that, that you become inured to it. Or there's the more cerebral approach where you sort of engage in the exploration of your own body as <clears throat> Schopenhauer kind of alludes to about your internal life, the life where you move your muscles, the life where you um, breathe in and breathe out, where you're not really sure how you're doing any of it, you're just intuiting yourself into your own body, or throughout your own body. <clears throat> the implication of in Ramakrishna's case, and I guess in Spock's case, was that it wasn't so much that they had deliberately inflicted so much pain as to get used to it, the way the Spartans did, <clears throat> but they so took control or sufficient control of their nervous system to at least allow them to cope with pain that would normally knock people unconscious. Um, that's an interesting thought. Um, I was talking yesterday that would spawn this a little short exchange with life is futile on the subject of suffering and you know this got me thinking about physical pain. Um, <clears throat> I'm not advocating this for anybody, and I'm not telling anybody who's in extreme physical pain, oh, try this and everything will be wonderful. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just positing the idea that um, we have some say in the pain that we feel. Um, you know, you put a red-hot poker in a strategic orifice in one's body, and you can usually predict the reaction of the person who is on the receiving end of that. But it is conceivable to so discipline yourself, or to so master your nervous system, and I don't, I don't mean be a complete master of it, but to at least, I wouldn't say lessen the pain, but I would say alter the experience of that pain somewhat. Um, we've all seen what happens when a kid stubs his toe. He'll jump around and scream and yell and cry and everything. Whereas an old guy with aches and pains who lives with pain every second of his life, you know, back aches, headaches, uh, you know, maybe, you know, just the usual aches and pains that seem to proliferate as you age. I'm 50 and I'm starting to feel it. <clears throat> the older guy is gonna gonna recover fairly quickly from it because he's just used to it. it, it well, in as much as you can get used to pain. Um, so there does seem to be some argument for I won't say pain reduction because again Ramakrishna wasn't reducing the amount of pain he was feeling. Um, he wasn't using any kind of anesthetic. He was simply putting his mind in such a place where, you know, he was aware of the pain. Um, a day, and um, not a day in the life of I Ivan Denisovich, but the le the death of Ivan Ilyich by Tolstoy refers to this as well. When um, Ivan Ilyich is in the final stages of a terrible kidney condition, uh, painful, excruciatingly painful, and he goes, oh. Yeah, there's the pain. It's still there. But that's not really what I was worried about. I was worried about death. That scared me a lot more. I can handle the, the pain. Let's concentrate on death. Um, you know, the, the, there's so many references in literature and everything about people being able to at least influence how they experience physical pain. Um, right now I'm sitting upright and I have repetitive strain injury in this arm on a muscle back here. It's really annoying me right now, but I feel it all the time. And it's just part of life now, and it doesn't fundamentally wreck my enjoyment of life. If I was in chronic horrific pain, of course that's different. But I would posit the view that it's at least conceivable that we could master our pain. Um, I mentioned a little big man. Um, the native people here, when uh, they have their retreats or whatever, the, to this day they still practice something called the sun dance, where, like here on the plains, uh, this deeply masochistic kind of um, ceremony where 
males, and I think females even sometimes, have wooden pegs inserted underneath the muscles in their back or in their chest, and they either lean back with strings attached to it to a pole, they lean back and they either just sit there with their body weight concentrated on this, these two or four wounds with pegs in it, until either the they tear loose, usually that doesn't happen, because they're they're held in place by muscles, or until they faint, or whatever, something weird starts to happen. Um, oftentimes they're hoisted up and they hang from that. Usually it's people hang from their backs with these pegs in their flesh underneath, um, underneath muscles, and the muscle is sufficient to hold them in place. They don't bat an eyelid. Um, apparently it's an extremely profound ceremony with life-changing or ritual, or I don't know what you'd even call that, shock therapy, with life-changing or mind-changing implications. What's going on there? Usually the people that do this are looking for something. They have an issue that they want to sort out. Um, and, you know, Oftentimes it's somebody who has got some kind of psychological issue, like a bad divorce, or they might have an addiction, or some kind of problem. And the Sundance apparently is extremely effective in, de in helping these people cope with this. Um, well, that's kind of even a therapeutic use of excruciating pain and over deliberately overwhelming your central nervous system. Um, what's going on in all these cases? Uh, this, you know, a lot of the <laughs> examples I've given are sci-fi or fiction, but there are real-world cases of this, of people not only learning to endure mind-blowing pain, but actually using it to some benefit or some advantage. What kind of input do we have? Spock says pain is a thing of the mind. The mind can be controlled. It takes enormous effort, but it can be done. Um, what does that say about the fundamental nature of pain?